بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على محمد آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد Welcome to the third session in this subject which is interest bearing transactions in the US I think والله أعلم that the basic fundamental the jurisprudential rules of الربه have been covered in the first and the second session now it's your it's your turn it's your time to determine the permissibility or the impermissibility of the transactions. What I want you to do is the following. Whenever we, whenever we, we have a, a study case, a transaction, I will ask you a very straightforward question. Is this transaction loan contract or a sale contract? Okay, because now it's time for us to implement all the rules that we, that we covered already in the transaction. By the way, this session and the next sessions are the most important part of this seminar because this is, you know, what we are looking for. Now it's time for us to know what is riba and what is not riba. So whenever we have a transaction, I will ask you a very straightforward question. Is this a loan or not? Is it a sale contract or not? If it is a loan, are the conditions and the stipulations that we, that we will aware of completely fulfilled here? Or, or otherwise. If it is otherwise, then the transaction is by default riba. If it is a sale contract, are the conditions for the soundness of the sale contract in Islam implemented, completely satisfied here or not? If yes, then alhamdulillah, this transaction is permissible. Otherwise, then by default, this transaction is not permissible and it will, you know, convert it to a user's sale transaction. Let me start with the, with the first transaction which is which is the bank loan bank loan means that you approach or you know somebody else approaches the bank and ask him for money now the question here is it a sale contract or a loan contract it is it is a loan contract okay now according to our standard is there any extra money stipulated from the beginning to be paid back to the bank whether you pay on time or you, you delay your payment yes right the answer is yes then what is the status of this of this transaction according to our standards that we already set. It is, it is, well, this is, yeah, this is riba al-fadl and riba al-nasah, riba al-fadl because the, because the amount has to be, um, you know, exceeded the original capital have been, you know, advanced to you from the bank. Second of all, it is riba al-nasah because you will defer or delay your payment. You take the loan and after two or three months you start paying back the, the bank. So there is no mutual submission at the spot or while contracting. So there is riba al-fadl and riba al-nasa. The basic rule, the basic rule is that this transaction is prohibited because this is the most explicit example of applying a riba. And this is the exact category or kind of riba have been implemented during the time of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this, this ayah, Ya ayuhal ladheena amanu, اتقوا الله وذروا ما بقي من الربا إن كنتم مؤمنين. أو يهو بليم في الله سبحانه وتعالى be conscious to him and stop dealing with riba if you claim to be believers. This kind of riba actually is riba الجاهلية or riba الدين. كان الرجل يقرض الرجل فإذا جاء موعد الأجل قال أمهلني وأزيدك. The people during الجاهلية the pre the pre-Islamic period of ignorance before the prophethood of Muhammad والسلام, people used to transact or to lend from each other or to borrow from each other. So when, when someone borrowed a specific amount from the other party, when it is the due date for him to pay off the loan, he would approach the lender by saying, Amhilni wa azidu, give me a break, give me more time, and I will increase the amount. I will give you more than you know, the original capital that I have borrowed from you. كان الرجل يقرض الرجل فإذا جاء موعد الأجل قال أمهلني وأزيدك In this specific kind of riba Allah سبحانه وتعالى revealed this ayah يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وذروا ما بقي من الربا So this ayah actually is addressing riba al-qard riba al-qard أو riba al-dain أو riba al-jahiliya They are the same This is the exact kind of riba that the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام addressed by cursing those four parties who are involved in this transaction لعنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم آكل الربا ومؤكله وكاتبه وشاهده. It does not make any difference whether the purpose behind this loan 
is to invest or to consume or it is a study, you know, I mean, it's a student loans. It's the same, the basic rule. I'm not here involving a darura. I'm not here considering whether or not there is a darura or necessity. I'm not saying about, I'm not talking about the pressing need. If there is a pressing need for that, I'm talking about the basic rule. Is this transaction basically haram or halal? Definitely it is haram because this is, you know, the most explicit example of a riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, mentioned clearly. Late fees or charges. Now, when you are a subscriber with the, with the, with the local uh, electric company, is there any loan contract between you and, and them? There is no loan actually. They provide you a service. At the end of the month, you should pay them out of the service. Once you receive the, your monthly bill, let's say for example, $150 out of the electricity that you already used. Logically speaking, or theoretically speaking, there is no loan contract. Now this is the, this is the legal interpretation of this transaction. They provide you a service and you pay them money out of providing this service. However, from an Islamic point of view, it's not the case. Regardless of the reason, regardless of the definition of the transaction, as long as you owe somebody else, entity, company, person, individual, group of people, no matter what, as long as you owe other people, regardless of the reason behind this, you know, behind this money that you have to pay them back, it is directly translated or converted to a loan. As long as you owe them money, then you are in debt, regardless of the, of the reason behind this debt. So this is why late fees actually is one of the, one of the examples. It's not that explicit example of, of riba. Let me, let me elaborate more. Any late fees paid out of, out of a loan. If you, if you already you know, borrowed a specific amount of money, and there was a stipulation that if you did not pay on time, then you will be charged a specific amount, and this is, this is the late fees, right? Now, if it is out of your utility bill, your, your um, cell phone you know, uh, uh, bill, your uh, electric bill, whatever it is, you know, uh, water bill, whatever it is, okay? If there is, a, if there is a late fees, then this is actually one of the examples of, of riba. I'm not saying that, that you know, being a subscriber to get uh, your cell phone service or your uh, landline service or electricity is, is prohibited. I'm, I'm just, you know, saying that the late fees indicated in the contract or in the statement or in the bill that you receive is among a riba. Because again, from our point of view as Muslims, whatever you owe others, then it is a loan regardless of the reason or regardless of the definition of the, of the, of the contract have been signed between you and the, and the other party. At the end of the month, you owe the electric company a specific amount of money. Even though they, they did not lend you, you know, some cash money, they provide you a service, but you owe them this, this money. So if there is a, a utility bill, deferred payment sale. What do you mean by deferred payment sale? Sometimes actually when you buy, you know, a commodity or, or asset or whatever it is, if you do not have enough cash money to pay in full, the, you know, the, the, the sale man or, or the owner of the property or the asset might give you a break of two or three months. You take the car, for example, without paying any single penny, but you have to pay in full after three months. Now, if there was a point or minute in the contract that if you did not pay on time, there will be an extra money or late fees, then this is uh, considered as a late fees. It falls under the same category that we are talking about. How about payment plan or paid on monthly basis? Like when you do a finance, for example, if there is a point in the contract, again, that your monthly payment, your monthly payment is $250, okay, to be paid in full within the first three days of the month. Okay, any, any further day after that, if you did not pay during the first three days, there will be a charge of $5. Sometimes they call it late fees, administrative fees, penalty, whatever they call it, it falls under this category, which is late fees or late charges. Now, this is what I mean by late fees or charge. What is the status of the late fees. Is it riba or not? If we believe that whatever I owe the other party is, is a debt or a loan from an Islamic perspective, then whatever I have to pay out of that extra in, in, in the top of the original amount 
is by default is by default a river. Now, there is a question here. Can I avoid the late fees? Or first of all, is it my option to add this point in the contract or not? It's not my option. Those kind of contracts are called in al-fiqh al-islami as uqudu al-idhan, the dominating contracts. This is the contract. You take it or you leave it. You don't have the you don't have the right to negotiate the points of the contract with the other company. This is a standard contract. Okay? If you want, for example, electricity or landline, you know, a phone or whatever service you are looking for, this is the contract. You take it or, or you leave it. That's it. Since you are in need for the service, you have the right to involve in this transaction or to be a subscriber. The only thing you have to worry about is that you have to make sure that you pay, you pay your utility bills or any kind of bill kind of bills in full before the due date, just to avoid being charged any extra money. Again, because it's not your choice whether to take this minute or to add it in the contract or not. It's not, it's not, your, it's not your choice. This is why I said here, a Muslim must, take, must, must make sure to pay on time to avoid involving himself in any interest-bearing activities. In the ideal situation, if we, if we live in a society in which the Islamic economic system is 100% implemented, there is no way to add the late fees. Definitely there are some other ways or methods for the other party to secure their rights, like for example to ask for a co-signer or for a guarantor or to disconnect the you know, service or to loss, sue you. I mean, they have many, many ways to guarantee and, to, and secure their money. However, adding the late fees from an Islamic point of view is prohibited and it is not, it is not allowed. Let me, let me finish, please. Before, before, I, before I leave this point to an, an, another one, again, we are, we are going through the same, the same procedure. Any transaction, it has to be identified according to our standards. Is it a sale contract or it is a loan contract? How about this one? Is it a loan or sale according to our understanding? It is, it is, it is a loan, actually. It is a loan. Whatever you owe the other party, is a loan. So all the rules of, of, of the loan contract in Islam or the restrictions and the regulations that we already mentioned, that there is no extra money has to be paid or has to be stipulated from the beginning, has to be 100% implemented. Uh, implemented here. Otherwise, it will be converted into a, a user's, user's loan. What if someone could not, could not pay on time? He ran out of cash, could not find a, a free of interest loan from any Muslim brother, and he found himself charged an extra money. We cannot, you know, we can't say nothing. But we are talking about someone who is financially able to pay on time before the due date, and he intentionally, for a purpose, he, he, he deferred or delayed his payment. Definitely, he's atheist and, and the sinner because, because he involved himself, you know, in this useless uh, uh, transaction. Okay, credit card. Let's talk about the, the unsecured card. Now the same question. What what do you know about credit card? If you if you wanna if you wanna introduce this transaction, intentionally I wanna go back to the previous slide. If you wanna introduce this transaction or identify this transaction to somebody else who does not have any background about credit card as it is implemented in the US, how could you define credit card? Is it a sale contract or it is a loan contract? I wanna hear from you. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Is it, is it a loan contract? Yes, it is actually an, it is an agreement. It is an agreement between the client, which is, which is me you know, in this example, and the credit company, allowing me to withdraw a specific amount of money. And this, this money could be used either by withdrawing cash money from any ATM machine. I can use it you know, for purchasing anything I want. It could be used to pay my utility bills, right? Is there any other use for the credit card? You withdraw cash money, you purchase, or you pay your bills, right? Now, the Islamic interpretation of this transaction is a loan because of a very simple reason. When you hold a credit card, it means that you do not have money. I mean, you do not, you do not own any money. You just, you just borrow from the credit company. It's not like the checking account, for example. When you have a checking account and debit card, it means that you really own some dollars have been deposited by you in the bank and you withdraw from your own money. So there is no, there is no loan uh, involved, right? But when it comes to credit, it's a different story. You are the, uh, you are the borrower, 
and the credit company is the is the lender. So all the rules that we mentioned regarding you know a, a loan contract in, in Islam has to be 100% implemented in this transaction. I'm not saying that holding credit card is haram. I'm not saying it's halal. I'm, I'm just you know I'm just you know helping you identifying or defining what kind of contract we are talking about. It's not a sale contract. It is a it is a loan contract. Are we agree? Do we agree? Okay. Okay. What's wrong with the with the credit card? Why why we need to study this this transaction more? As you all know, by holding a credit card, you have to sign an agreement. It doesn't have to be a long contract. It's just an agreement. You have to sign, and they have to you know check your credit history. When you sign a contract, there is a point, or maybe more than one point, that in some specific cases, you will be charged extra money. Like for example, if you delay your payment, once you receive your credit statement, the due date is uh, June 15th. After June 15th, even if you choose to pay in full, there will be an extra money. So if you intentionally, while financially able to pay on time, and you delay your payment, then actually, I mean, you subject yourself to this, to this, you know, user's point, and you have to pay you know, extra money. So this is the first case, delayed payment, when it comes to one-time payment. Cash withdrawal. Sometimes, sometimes if you withdraw some cash money from the ATM machine belong to the, to the same company, like you have a credit card from Charter One, okay? And you use the Charter One ATM machine. If they, they charge you, ch charge you one or two dollars, specific per you know, percent, lump sum, whatever, out of allowing you cashing some money or withdrawing some money, this is what I mean by, by cash withdrawal. When withdrawing from the ATM machine of the credit company. Like for example, if you withdraw 100, they will charge you 100, two dollars. 100, the exact amount that you withdraw already, and 200 is the administrative fees or you know, whatever they wanna call it. Now this is the second case. The third one, payment plan on a monthly basis or settlement. If you, if you, if you look at the credit statement that you receive by the end of the month, there is, a, there is an option. Like for example, if, if your balance is 500, they give you the option to go with the minimum, which is $15, right? You, you do have the right, instead of paying $500 in full, you just pay them $15. By paying this amount, it means for them that you agree to do an installment. Installment means that the 500 will be increased, it might become 600 more or less, and you will do a payment plan with them. Instead of paying at full, you pay the whole amount within six months, one year less or more, and definitely because of this deferment in your payment, the 500, it's not gonna stay 500 as is, it will be increased, will be you know, more than 500. This is what I mean by payment plan. Here in the US, purchasing from overseas or outside the, the United States, they take this transaction as if you are withdrawing some cash money. So they make some money out of, out of this transaction. If you choose to purchase something from overseas, they charge you in addition to the exact amount that you withdraw through your, through your credit card. Now, all these examples and, and much, much more are what, what we mean by, by adding extra money in the top of the exact amount that you have withdrawn. Again, it's not by choice. This is something written in the contract. You take it or you leave it. It's, it's up to you. There is no way to avoid the late fees. This is why I said here, the above condition, the above condition is a useless condition. Agreeing to this condition is prohibited if you have the choice to say yes or no. But definitely we do not have the choice. I mean, something by default comes with the, with the contract. Until now, I didn't say anything about the status of the credit card, whether you know, it is halal or, or haram. Now, the prohibited actions or the prohibited items, the prohibited things in, in, in Islamic legislation or regulation could be classified into two different categories. There is something haram I mean, some of the actions are prohibited by themselves. I mean, the action itself is prohibited. There is another kind of prohibited matters in Islam. We call them in the fiqh al-islami al-muharramatu li Something is prohibited because of its 
result because of its consequences with the opposite gender from one side and, and committing fornication or, or adultery. Both of them actually are prohibited. A Muslim is not allowed to, you know, shake hand with the, of the maharam of his woman. Uh, I mean, if, if a woman is not a mahram, like your mom, your sister, your daughter, whatever, handshaking, basically the basic rule, regardless of whether or not you can apply it here in, the, in this society, it's a different story. I'm talking about the basic rule. Handshaking is, is prohibited. But actually this prohibition is something prohibited because of its consequences, because according to our belief, Staying with women in, in seclusion, mutual looking, as long as there is no need for that, handshaking, and so on and so forth. Those are some means that might take or mislead the two opposite genders to go through the wrong direction and end up with, with committing uh, adultery or for, you know, for the king. This is what we believe in. So this is why the Prophet ﷺ prohibited us from looking into the opposite gender as long as there is no need for that. If there is a need for that, like uh, teaching, learning, medical treatment, transacting, interacting, there is nothing wrong with that. As long as there is a need, there is a haja for that, then a mutual looking between the opposite gender is, is allowed. If there is no need, then looking is prohibited. Now, my point here is that being involved, la Allah, in fornication or adultery definitely is prohibited. Handshaking and the mutual looking and staying in seclusion, like in khalwa, with, with an unmahram woman, is also prohibited. But could we say that, that both sins are in the same level of, of, of prohibition? Definitely, they are not. They are not. Handshaking is prohibited because it might take, it might take after a while to the other sin which is, which is committing adultery. So this is why handshaking is prohibited because of its consequences and adultery is prohibited by itself. Because you know, the, the first sin might take or lead to the, to the other one. This is just an example to differentiate between al-haram ulidatihi the prohibited matter because, because of itself and al-haram ghayri the prohibited matters because of its consequences. Definitely al-haram ulidati is in a higher level, is more prohibited than al-haram al-haram ghayrihi. Another example, if someone is involved in, in riba, okay, he paid it to others or he took it from others. This is actually something is haram ulidati, it's prohibited by, by itself because he or she already involved in this transaction. However, if you sign a contract indicating a point that, that late fees will be charged if you did not pay on time, this is also haram. But actually it is, it is haram ul do, you know, do you know why? Because, uh, because until now, for the time being, you did not involve yourself in riba. And there is a good possibility if you keep paying systematically on time before the due date, you might not be you know, uh, fallen in, in riba at all, right? So this is why. Signing a contract indicating a point that there will be late fees is, is haram. If there is an ideal situation in which all the Islamic principles are completely implemented, there is no way to add the late fees. However, signing a contract or holding a, a credit card, you know, indicating a point that late fees will be charged is haram. However, it is haram it's, it's prohibited because of its consequences. Again, because there is a good possibility you know, to avoid the slate fees and to stay on the safe side by keeping, by keep paying your, your, your monthly balance systematically on time before the, before the due date. Why we went through all these details? What does it have to do with, with our subject? Haram li dhati wal haram li ghayri. The reason is, it's well known in the, in the rules of al-fiqh al-islam that if something is prohibited by itself, haramun lidatihi, it could not be permitted unless if there is a necessity, there is a life or death situation. Like for example, what is mentioned in the Quran three, four times when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking about the status of eating from the meat of the dead animals. فَمَنَ اضْطُرَّ حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُ الْمَيْتَةُ وَالدَّمُ وَلَحْمُ الْخَنْزِيرَ Until he said subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَمَنَ اضْطُرَّ غَيْرَ بَاغٍ وَلَا عَادٍ فَلَا أَثْمَ عَلَيْهِ فَمَنْ أَطْرَّ فِي مَخْمَصَةٍ غَيْرَ مُتَجَانِفٍ لِإِثْمٍ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ If someone is traveling and he ran out of, out of sustenance for food or, or drink and he was about to die and the only option he had at that time is to eat from a, a meat of a, of a dead animal does he have the right to eat from it or, or not? Definitely he does have the right rather actually he must he must to survive he must eat from this 
you know, meat of the dead animal. This is just an example to show that, that whatever is, is prohibited because of itself is permitted in case of necessity. In this case, actually, it's, it's a life or death, it's a life or death situation. It's a life or death situation. Eating from the dead animal is prohibited by itself because of the necessity implemented here, you know, it be, you know, it became, it became permitted. This is just, just an example showing what do you mean by al-haramu lidhatihi tubihu al-darura. Something is prohibited by itself, it could be permitted in case of necessity. However, it is not the case when it comes to al-haramu lighayri. If there is something is prohibited because of its consequences, it would be permitted in case of having a need or pressing need. And according to our categorization in fiqh al-Islami, there is a big difference between al-darura and al-haja, al-amr al-tahsin. Al-darura is a life or death situation. Very, very necessary thing. You cannot survive with that. Okay? Al-haja is something that you could avoid, but actually it will, it will make your life very, very hard. You need to have it. However, you can survive without, without having it. Okay? Now, when it comes to al-haramu, al-haramu li ghayrihi, something is prohibited, because of its consequences, okay, because it might lead to al-haram li dhati, this kind of, of, of haram or prohibited you know, matter could be permitted. Actually, it is permitted in case of having a pressing need. Hajatun haqiqiyya. It's a true and pressing, pressing need. What does have this to do with, with our point? I mean, we went away from the you know, status of a credit card. What does have to do with, with the credit card? Now just remember with me that الحرام لذاته تبيحه الضرورة والحرام لغيره تبيحه الحاجة And the, the, the level of, of, of haram included in, in, in the credit card is among الحرام لذاته or الحرام لغيره الحرام لغيره Do you still remember that? Okay Now for the, for the people who reside here in the in the U.S. Do you think that holding a credit card here in the U.S. is a necessity? Is it something that you cannot survive with that? Do you think so? Is it is it darura? Is it, is it a life or death situation? Is it like eating from a dead animal for the traveler who ran out of food or drink? It's not. Okay. Is it a true need for the people who reside here in this society? Is it a true need or not? What means? Can you rent a house? Can you rent an apartment? Can you book your tickets online without having credit card? You cannot. Practically speaking, holding or having a credit card here in this society is, is a true and public need. I mean, we all need the service. It's really, really hard to proceed with your daily transactions. Subhanallah, some points of sale, they do not, they do not take cash money. They do not take checks. They do not take uh, debit card. It has, to be, it has to be credit card. If you do not have credit card, you cannot, you cannot buy from that store. So I do believe that holding a credit card here in this, I'm not, I'm not talking about Muslims who live in Saudi Arabia or in Jordan or in Africa. No, I'm talking about the the American Muslims who live here in this society, yes, they do need this service, which is to have a good, a good you know, credit history and holding a credit card to be able to proceed and to facilitate their daily transactions here in the, in the U.S. Now, having said that, remembering that signing a contract to hold a, or to have a credit card is prohibited because of its consequences and there is a need there is a need for having a credit card. If you combine those two pieces together and you know you go back to the to the qaid or to the rule, al haram li dhatihi tubihu al darura, wal haram li ghayrihi tubihu al haja. There is haram li ghayrihi in holding the credit uh, card, and there is a haja for it. There is a need for it. So this is why we definitely here in the U.S., not in the Middle East, we say that holding credit card basically basically is allowed and it is not prohibited. Believe it or not, our mashayikh in the Middle East until now, even, even Majma Fuqaha al Sharia, they, they are of the opinion that holding credit card in the Middle East is prohibited. Do you know why? Because of this point. Because there is a point that if you delay your payment, you have to pay extra money. This is by itself a haram. But, but here actually in the US we say it is haram, but it's haram because of its consequence. Because you might be involved in riba if you did not pay on time. However, 
you have a chance to pay on time and not to be involved in this, in this late, late fee. So this is why holding credit card here in the US basically is allowed and it's not prohibited. When we say that holding credit card is, is permissible, it's not, a, it's not a loose fatwa. It has actually some, some, some rules and some stipulations. If all of them are fulfilled, satisfied, then holding credit card is permissible and vice versa. If not, then holding it is not. The first one, reaching a stage of a real need. You do need this service. What, just hypothetically saying, what if someone does not need this service? You know, for some reason, just, just say that someone does not need this service for any reason. He should not hold the credit card because of the same reason. There is a point of late fees. Abstaining from withdrawing cash from the credit company if it is a chargeable service. To the best of my knowledge, if you withdraw cash money from any ATM machine of the same company that you hold its credit card, it is, it is, a, it is a chargeable one. If it is a chargeable one, then it is prohibited. You cannot, you cannot. Do you know why? Because by withdrawing some cash money, you know in advance that you will be charged extra money. You will be charged extra money. So you borrow from the credit company 100 and they charge you how much? 102, 105, whatever it is, this is, this is a riba actually. The third condition is that paying bills in full before the due date. Do not delay your payment at all. Fourth one, refraining from using it when having sufficient credit scores. This is just a hypothetical point. I know that if you stop using your credit card, you will start losing your credit points, right? But what if, just say, again, hypothetically saying, what if someone have reached a level of, of, of credit you know, scores and he was not in need for the service for good? Could he keep or is he allowed to keep using his credit card? He should, he should not. For the vast majority of the Muslim community in the US, all these four conditions are completely fulfilled. So holding a credit card for Muslims in the US is allowed and not prohibited. How about the annual fees? It might be a confusing point for those who, who believe that, that you, you borrow, for example, $1,000 during the month, or let's say $12,000 during the year, and they charge you extra money. They charge you $35 plus, plus or, or minus as an as a issuance fees or annual fees. Sometimes they call it administrative fees. Is it allowed for you to pay it or not? Yes, it is. Because actually it, it, it has nothing to do with the actual use of the credit. I mean, whether you use it or not, it, it's the same. To keep it valid, actually you have to pay $35, you know, or, or $39, whatever it is, per year. Since it has nothing to do with the actual use of the credit card, then it has nothing to do with, with, with riba. So paying an annual fees is, is allowed. You need to be careful. Some of the credit companies, some of the banks here in the US, actually here in, 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 in Michigan, I remember long time ago, I applied for a credit card through Charter One. And they told me that you have to pay extra money even if you pay on time. Maybe the banker was not accurate or she did not you know, understand me well, but this is what I understood from here, that even if you pay on time, yet you have to pay extra money. If this is the case, then having credit card through this company or this bank is definitely prohibited because holding credit card means that, that actually you subject yourself for, for riba or, or extra amount of money has to be paid. Now, what if you, for some reason, couldn't find an ATM machine of the same credit company that you hold its credit card, and you find ATM machine belongs to a different company, and out of, you know, servicing you, they charge you a specific amount of money, percent or, or, or lump sum. What is the status of this, of this administrative or service fees? Is it, is it a loan or not? What do you think? Sorry. It's not a loan. Actually, they, they, they will draw some money from your account on your behalf and just bring you the money. So out of servicing you, out of spending some, you know, some time and, and effort to bring you some money from your original account, they deserve actually to take some money out of that. So it is really a service fees. So if you withdraw cash money from any ATM machine does not belong to the company that you hold its credit card, Actually, it is, it is not riba. It is really a service. It's, it's really a service fees. Because actually, the, the, you know, the, the, the third party is not the lender. You are not, you are not you know, borrowing money from them. You ask them to bring you some money from your original account. And out of servicing you, they deserve you know, this, this uh, amount. 
We call it in the fiqh al-Islam, aqdu, aqdu wakala. You ask somebody to do, you know, uh, to help you or to do something in your behalf, out of, out of servicing you, he deserves to take some money. That's it. Okay. As you all know, when you use your credit card, purchasing uh, uh, some commodities for $100, for example, the merchant, you know, charge you 100 However, he does not receive more than 97 or 98 And the credit company would deduct $2 plus or minus for this transaction. What is the status of this, of this deduction? Is it riba or not? Again, you need to ask yourself the same question. If you agree that, that the basic contract between you and the credit company is a loan. Now you ask yourself this question. You have you know, uh, uh, paid 100, okay, and the merchant knew or the businessman knew in advance that he's not gonna receive the 100 in full. There will be an amount you know, deducted out of servicing him through the credit company. What is the status of this deduction? Is it riba or not? It's actually in the, in the, in the opposite of riba. I mean, the, the three parties, you as a client or, or, or a customer, he as a merchant or a businessman, the third company, which is the, I mean, the third party, which is the credit company, you all know that there will be a service fees or administrative fees or fee, whatever they want to call it, out of, out of providing the service. If you all agree and there is, there is, there is no riba involved, he deserves 100 and he does not have any problem with receiving only 98 or 97 dollars. He's, he's okay with that. The credit company is okay with that and you, you are okay with that. So there is no, there is no riba involved at all. That was one of the, one of the ways that credit, credit companies make, make money. The merchant, the client, and the credit company know and agree that, okay. It doesn't make any difference whether they deduct a lump sum or, or percent. Usually, they do not take a, a percentage. It's just one or two dollars lump sum, you know, per transaction. Whether you purchase for 100 or 1,000, usually they just deduct a, and even, even if they take a, a percentage, one percent, you know, one percent, two percent less, you know, or more, it doesn't make a difference. It's, it's a service, service fees. What do you mean by credit transfer? From one credit company to, to another. And usually the, you know, the new company try to attract more customers by offering you zero APR, right? Just transfer your, your debt to us and we will offer you zero PR, annual percent rate. Now, in order for them to provide you this service, they ask for administrative fees to transfer the money or the fund from the first company to them. The question here again, what is the status of, of this? I, I, I mean, you know, having, having um, zero APR, it's, it's clear that there is no river, right? If you owe the, the first company 5,000 and you, you transfer it to the second company, it's gonna be only 5,000, not more and not less. But what is the status of the extra amount that they, that they will charge you out of transferring or offering you the service from the first company or the, your, your original company to the, to the new one? What do you think? Service fees. I used to believe that it is riba because, because the, and actually this is what, what, what's written here, I think, right? This fees is, uh, is riba. Actually, it's not. This fees, this, this fees is riba because, because the new company is the lender and the, and the paid back money should not exceed the original debt. Well, yes, they are the lender. They are lender. But you know, it really takes them some time and some effort. It costs them some money to transfer. I mean, there is some administrative work to transfer the fund from or the debt from one company to, to another. They have employees, they have computers, they have whatever they have. So they need some money, okay, to, only to transfer the money from the first company to them. I do believe now, Wallahu Alam, that that you know the, 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 the credit transfer fees is not is not riba. So as long as you find a zero APR in a, in a different company, if they ask for a specific amount, a reasonable amount, reasonable amount, to transfer the money, wallahu alam, wallahu alam, it is, it is not riba. Even, even though the new company will be the lender and you will be the borrower, but actually this money is, is justified as, as transfer fees because again, they do need, 
some money to transfer the, so they transfer the, the debt on, on your expense, on your expense. They charge you, they charge you the, the money only, only to transfer the fund from the original, original credit company to, to them. So this is why, Wallahu alam, I do not see it, uh, I do not see it riba. I recently actually, actually changed my mind after a, a discussion with, the, with Dr. Salah al-Sawi. He told me that if there is a, a condition from the beginning that the, that the borrower must submit the loan in a specific place or a specific country, any, any charges or any fees out of transferring the money from the first place to another one should be, you know, charged to the, to the debtor or to the borrower himself. So, Wallahu alam, there is no riba involved in this. Wallahu alam. Now, there is another category of, of the credit card. They call it security deposit or the secured card. What is the definition of the secured card? Again, the same, the same question, the same routine question. Is it a sale contract or is it a, or is it a, a loan contract? W what do you think? Secured card. If they ask you, if they ask you, for example, to deposit, deposit $500, okay? And then you get the credit card and you use the 500. You, you already purchased with the amount of 500. Are you break even with the company or you do have to pay them the 500? You are not, you are not break even with them. You have to pay them back. Okay, what's, what's the point behind, behind asking this question, Akhi? First of all, first of all, the, the secured credit card is, as it is called, it, it, is, it is a credit card. However, it is issued for those who do not have any credit history or those who do not have enough points actually to have an unsecured credit card. So in order for the company to secure their money, they give you a line of credit up to the amount that you are willing to deposit. This deposited amount actually is not for your use, it's just a deposit. Like for example, if you have zero credit history, okay, and you want to have a line of credit up to 3,000, okay, they ask you to deposit $3,000 and you start using your secured credit card, okay? Once you, once you consume the whole amount or use the whole amount, they ask you to pay the $3,000 back. You receive a, you know, a, a monthly statement. You keep you know, paying you know, back and forth, using and, and paying, okay? Until the end of the contract, which is, which is usually lasts for one year up to 18 months, okay? By that time, after you pay off in full all the amount that you owe the credit company, they return you back the deposit amount that you, you know, uh, paid or deposited in the, in, the, in the beginning. So my point here is that it is, a credit, it is a credit card. It is issued for those who do not have, you know, enough credit, credit, credit uh, points. Sometimes by, by the end of the, of the contract, like for in our example, if you, if, if, if you chose to have... Uh, $3,000 line of credit, and the 18 months already passed, and the contract is already expired. They return you, you know, to you, they pay you back the $3,000 plus extra money. This extra money actually is justified as we do appreciate your business, blah, 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 and they give you $100, $200, whatever, more or less. Okay, what is the status of this money? Is it halal for you to take? Do you have to return it back? Do you have to just throw it away? What should you do with the, with the money? Or first of all, how did they get the money? They invested your money without informing you, without considering your permission. They took your money, they invested it in the way that they want, definitely in an interest way. They re, you know, they re lended the money to a third party and they get, let's say, 7% riba. They give you, you know, a 0. 0.0.0.5, you know, interest and they gave it back to you as a gift. We do appreciate your your business. So you know for sure that the credit company have generated this money out of useless transaction, useless loan. They give you the money. You have to make sure that this money for you is definitely prohibited. You have to get rid of it. You cannot return it to the company because you encourage them, you support them to you know, hold more and more you know, uh, useless transaction. You cannot throw it away because the money could not be prohibited by itself. It could be prohibited because of the way that you generate the money. The only, the only solution for this money is to be paid for the masalih al-muslimin al Any project, any, any beneficial project for the Muslim community. You can give it to the masjid, yes you can. Give it to an Islamic school, you know, that's fine. But do not use it for your personal 
you do not spend this money in any of your dependent, any of your household, your, your dad, your mom, your, your wife, your, your kids, because this is a, a prohibited money for you. Masalih al al Muslim public benefits, Masjid Islamic school, whatever it is. What's the difference between, between holding a credit card and having a, a debit card? Debit card actually reflects a, a, a real amount that you, you own and you, know, you did deposit this amount in a, in a, in a checking account. So in, in instead of going physically to the bank and, and withdrawing money, they, you know, they make it easier for you by giving you a debit card, allowing you to access to the money that you already have and start you know, withdrawing from this, the, this money. So it is an easy way to withdraw from the client's checking account. Sometimes they charge you annual fees. That's fine. If annual fees is, is, is allowed for the credit card, it should be allowed for the debit card. Service fees for withdrawing cash are allowed too because, because actually you are not, because you are not a, a borrower in this case. You are not you know, borrowing money from them. You are taking from your own money. So if they want to charge you out of providing you this, this money and saving your time and effort and your money, you know, by going to the bank and, and getting the money, they deserve to take, you know, service, service fees. The only thing you should, you should consider in this case is to make sure you do not exceed, you know, you do not, you do not do what's called uh, uh, insufficient fund. Like, for example, if you know for sure that you have only $200, you should not, you must not use your debit card to purchase with the amount of 300 Because in this case, actually, the, 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 the transaction will be, will be processed. I mean, I mean, the transaction will not, will not be declined, okay? But in this case, the bank will pay the, the rest of the amount. In our example, uh, 300 while you have only 200, okay? They will take the 200 that you have, add 100 more from the bank, uh, from the bank, and they will charge you an extra money. What does it mean for us? What does it mean for us? When they pay on your behalf 100, dollars and they charge you more than 100 what does it mean is it a loan or sale it is it is a loan they they lend you the money and they charge you out of that definitely they, they do not you know call it interest and we do not care you know what they call it or how to they how, how they justify it from our point of view it is it is a loan this is why we had maybe two hours just explaining the rules of of the sale contract and loan contract in islam if they pay on your behalf one dollar and charge you you know insufficient funds, you know, uh, fees, okay, or, or penalty, then whatever they paid is a loan, whatever they charge you is, is interest, bottom line. Can you stop the service? I mean, if you go to the bank and ask them, you know, to decline your transaction if it is your debit limit, you cannot. And I tried that one time, long time ago. They said, we cannot do that. You have to check your, your balance every day and make sure that you do not use your debit card if you do not have sufficient fund. So from that day, alhamdulillah, I'm doing my best you know, to uh, do transactions within financial capacity without exceeding my limits.